My name is Morba Ja, and I'm an aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I lead a transdisciplinary research program in space safety, security, and sustainability. And I've partnered with spacewatch.global to start a new series of web talks, cafes, space cafes called Morba's Vox Populi, which is Latin for people's voice. So I hope to see you there. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be candid conversations about all sorts of stuff related to space safety, security, and sustainability. I am a space watcher. I'm Torsten Kreening. You're not your host today. No, that's that's wrong. I'm your not even your co-host. Uh, I'm the facilitator. I'm the publisher of Spacewatch.global and we are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and this Space Cafe podcast. We also opened our fan shop online where you can support us actively and become a space watcher, as you can see here, this cool t-shirt with Mariba. Edition one has cool max mass awesome t-shirts for you, your friends and the ones you love. Your support is needed to keep our independent journalism alive. And I can't repeat it enough. We need your support for what we do for you. If you missed any of our previous work web talks, we have an archive available on our web page on the event section and on YouTube. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to hand over to your host today, to Professor Moriba Jha. Over to you, Moriba. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, this is really, really awesome. It's, it's been a, a long time uh, kind of in, in the coming. At least it feels that way for me. Uh, I'm so, so honored uh, to be here with everybody today. Uh, I see we have a growing number of attendees. This is, this is really good. And, and welcome to this inaugural session of uh, More Buzz Vox Populi as part of the Space Cafe. And um, really what I wanna tell people is, this is gonna be very organic. Uh, the, 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 the guests that we have today, really awesome people doing amazing work, uh, which you'll, you'll, you'll be able to hear some of that. But because this is live and organic, I wanted to make it a point that uh, I didn't, send any questions to anybody before this. So basically everybody's just showing up. It's it, like I said on the website, it's almost like we're at this lounge. We're all in, in different places in, in the world, but we're coming together at this virtual lounge, chilling out in some chairs. We're gonna have a candid conversation about some stuff in space. And, uh, and throughout this, you know, um, this will be trial and error. So, so bear with us uh, during this first one. As you know, technology always works, never, never any flaws there. Uh, but I want to engage the audience, you, you the, the, the attendees, and, and bring you on board uh, to, to give us your opinions about some of the stuff as it kind of naturally bubbles up. So I wanted to start off with that. Um, I also wanted to, to take advantage and say thank you to, to, to my guest today, uh, starting with uh, uh, Dr. Elena Surkovich. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher uh, in, in Finland, uh, doing amazing uh, work as well. I want to welcome Dr. Meredith Rawls. Uh, she's an astronomer. Uh, I'm going to probably lead off with Meredith uh, because there's an important meeting happening today that she's going to have to actually brief uh, at after uh, our session here at Morbus Vox Populi. Uh, Daniel separately doing great things with tracking stuff in space. We're going to hear uh, some of that and how that plays into this. And of course, uh, my friend, Doug Lavero, uh, who's, who spent uh, many years in, 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 in government service and, and serving the community and, and brings a wealth of information as well. So, so thank you to, to all of you for saying yes to this, especially this kind of live shoot from the hip format uh, with, with no, no, no questions uh, uh, sent to you beforehand and just we'll take it as it goes. And uh, I, I appreciate uh, each and every one of you. And I, and I hope that you and your families, including you, the attendees, are safe and healthy during these times. Uh, it's, it's been rough uh, for, for me and my, 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 my family, and, and I can imagine for, for all of you as well. So uh, we'll make the best of this. Anyway, thank you very much. And with that, 
uh, I wanted to set set the tone uh, for for this conversation, right? So, wow, uh, I look at the current space traffic that we have going on, and uh, you know we have a number of growing objects uh, that are being launched. In the news, we see some kind of escalation about this country's doing this, that, and the other. Um, we hear from the astronomy community that uh, maybe there's some displeasure at uh, the growing number of objects, uh, anthropogenic space objects that are now re reflecting uh, energy, photons, uh, light uh, onto ground-based uh, observers. And the thing is, it's like, you know, the night skies have changed. My, my own story here, it's like when I, when I started this whole uh, adventure, I was, a, uh, I was a security policeman in the United States Air Force. I was enlisted uh, in the Air Force. I was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. I was with my M16 uh, guarding, guarding Minuteman 2 and Minuteman 3 systems. Montana has some dark skies, darker than where I grew up. So I grew up in Caracas, Venezuela. And let me tell you something. On a good night in Caracas, you can see the moon, okay? Uh, uh, there's a lot of light pollution in Caracas. Uh, you know, over six million people, lots of lights. So I wasn't used to that. When I went to Montana and I saw the night sky, I couldn't believe I could like see the Milky Way and stuff. It was just amazing. But the interesting thing is every once in a while, every once in a while, I'd see these dots of light kind of going across uh, the sky. And I was like wondering, you know, what is this stuff? What are these dots of light? And it dawned on me, I'm like, wow, it's, it's not planes, not meteors, uh, satellites, really, I can see this stuff? And so that really inspired me to start looking into trying to understand the motion of stuff in space, astrodynamics, all that stuff. So that started me off on my career, but it was seeing these dots of light crisscrossing the sky. And this was back in uh, like 1989, 1990. There are many more objects today. I'm sure that if I was in Montana looking at the night skies, I'd see a lot more stuff crisscrossing, a lot more difficult to, to not see that in a place with dark skies, right? So. So what I wanna do is this, right? The number of objects is gonna increase. We're not gonna stop launching stuff, but we need to have a candid conversation about this. Like, we, it can't just be people are doing things just because it's legal, or should it? Is, that, is it that simple? Ah, if it's legal, then it's okay. Um, to what extent do we need to have inclusive dialogues? Who needs to be brought to the table uh, in that decision-making process, in the licensing process? Does it matter what the impacts are to astronomy writ large? So, so that, that's what we wanna talk about today and see where that goes. And so what I wanna do is I wanna start by uh, you know, asking Meredith, it's like, okay, look, uh, you're gonna be briefing uh, about this stuff today. Maybe you could take a few minutes to just talk about what your role is, uh, uh, how do you see yourself uh, uh, a position here, maybe a little bit about uh, give people some insight on what this important meeting is that, that's, that's going on that you're gonna be briefing at uh, and, and why it's important to you. Sure, thanks, I'd be happy to talk about a little of that. So uh, as Morbis said, I'm an astronomer. Um, I'm at University of Washington in Seattle and I officially work with uh, Rubin Observatory, which is this giant, amazing telescope that they're building in Chile. And it's gonna take a high resolution movie of the night sky, so like every three nights, we're gonna have an entire full color new frame for this decade long movie. And the idea is that we're gonna be able to see really faint stuff and interesting like changing stuff and also like solar system objects like find new asteroids and comets and interstellar objects and stuff like that. Turns out we're also gonna find a whole bunch of satellites. So that's how I first got interested in this whole situation is just because my background in astronomy, uh, we're always thinking about, okay, you put a telescope on a mountain, you look up, there be a whole bunch of stuff in the way, right? There's gonna be clouds sometimes. You know, you have to think about your site. Is there a city nearby, right? You don't want lights from the city. But at least, I think for most astronomers, and I can only speak for myself, but I think most astronomers don't immediately think, oh no, satellites, like as a first like instinct when they're thinking about all the stuff that's gonna get in between like their picture 
and the reality of physics and space that they're trying to study. Um, but the numbers of satellites are just increasing really fast right now. And all of them, these new ones are a lot brighter than I think anybody expected, which I was actually surprised to hear. Like I've, I've talked with some, some of the folks from SpaceX and, and they say, oh yeah, we didn't think they were going to be this bright either. And I was like, oh great. So no one knows what's going on. That's, that's great. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the context for the, the meeting that I'm going to be presenting at later today is it is the uh, Dark and Quiet Skies for Science and Society. And there's been like a whole week about different aspects of that. So it covers everything from light pollution, just like the general idea of maybe when we shine light at night, it shouldn't just be this glaring bright monstrosity, which is kind of radical for some people. Um, then there's also uh, the effect on biology and the environment. It, it doesn't just mess with our ability to enjoy the Milky Way or see it at all, but it also messes with like melatonin and circadian rhythms and stuff like that. And I'm not a biologist, but the bit that I've learned is, is super fascinating and also a little scary. Uh, obviously the effects of optical astronomy, that was yesterday's whole topic. Um, and then today's topic is all about satellite constellations in particular. And so they use the term constellation when it's like a jillion of them instead of like four. I don't know what the official definition is. Um, but, you know, as you know, SpaceX and uh, Amazon Kuiper and OneWeb and quite likely other companies are in the process of uh, either already launching or have plans to launch and approval to varying degrees to launch like tens of thousands of satellites. Um, and so there's uh, an entire set of working groups um, that have kind of pulled together for the, today's version of the conference where we're analyzing how that's going to mess with astronomy from a whole different set of ways. And we're trying to propose like technical mitigations that could be done from both sides or any side uh, to help make astronomy still feasible, but not say like satellites are bad, we refuse to have any because that's not, you know, I, I, I think that there's a, a place in the middle that we can, we can hopefully find. And then Friday tomorrow is uh, all about radio astronomy, which is like a whole other ball of wax and less my particular area of expertise, but it turns out these things all transmit loudly bandwidths that also have, you know, if you have a radio telescope and you're trying to like observe some far distant faint interesting stuff, you're going to maybe just see a bunch of satellites instead. So it's a very multifaceted problem. It's a very underfunded problem in terms of like people actually being paid to study this and solve it because it's so new. Um, and it's moving very quickly, whereas the um, science and academia moves a lot more slowly. It takes like more than a decade to plan this big telescope that's under construction that I'm very excited to work for, but that, you know, suddenly the, the situation has changed a bit. So it's a little bit of the ground shifting under our feet. But anyway, that's, that's kind of my, my context I'm bringing to this. I, th I, think, I think that's awesome, Meredith. So, so before I, I uh, uh, ask uh, the other guests to, to kind of give me their opinions, um, I actually have this, this, this movie that you're going to be talking about uh, later on. I'm going to play that just so that people can have context of what we're talking about here when we say this possible kind of light pollution. And maybe as the movie is going on, if you want to speak to what uh, is, is transpiring here, f you know, feel free to do that. I'm going to try to share uh, the screen here with this specific thing. And uh, hopefully people can see this. I can see it. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah, this, is, this is great. I, I am indeed presenting a slide of this movie later today. So this will be a test, right? No. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so there you go. So, so what, what do you want to say about this thing? So, so this is a view of the sky from the Rubin Observatory site in Chile. And on the left, you're seeing a, a straight up view and then a couple different projections of how to visualize the whole sky. So gray areas are like below the horizon and blue is like up above what you can actually see. At the beginning of the night, you start getting a whole bunch of satellites, but then as the night progresses, uh, there are fewer because the, the, there tend to be more satellites brightly illuminated in twilight, so shortly after sunset and shortly before sunrise. So as the movie continues, you see there's kind of fewer and they're kind of going all to the western horizon because now it's getting on closer to midnight. On the right, you're seeing a little grid. These are different Messier objects. So these are uh, like cool nebula, interesting galaxies, fun star clusters. Um, they're, and I say fun not to be flippant, but because they're both good for astrophotographers and like amateur astronomers enjoy taking pictures of these things. And um, you know, it's like your, your pretty calendars, whatever. But it's also like we do real science on some of these objects. So not only do they look cool, but you know, we actually do study them. And so for each individual little object, um, we've put a little box of, you know, if you took a picture at this moment, what would you get? And, and the answer is often a satellite trail. So it's a, it's a challenging problem. And what's interesting is that this simulation is actually the current 
number of satellites and anthropogenic space objects. I'm actually not sure what size it goes down to, but it's uh, some. Do you, do you know offhand more? Yeah, yeah. So basically, it's going down to what's in the catalog. So probably like 10 centimeter type stuff. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So reasonably small, but there's a whole bunch more even smaller that we can't even track. So that's reassuring. Uh, and and now you can see that it's getting on towards the end of the night. So there's a, a whole swath of stuff kind of starting to rise in the east that precedes the sun. And so if you're trying to do any of these solar system searches for killer asteroids, uh, for example, just throw a random example out there, uh, you're going to want to be looking in twilight kind of towards the sun, and you're maybe going to just see a whole bunch of satellites. <laughs> So that's, that's great. No, this is, this, is really, this is really amazing. Thank you so much for, for uh, giving us the soundtrack to this. Uh, well, you thank know, you for I, making I, the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. But no, I, I really appreciate that. And hopefully this gives people some context, like a, you know, pictures worth a thousand words sometimes. So this is great. And um, you know, I know that Dan, when you, said, when, 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 when you made the statement about uh, can't track smaller, I know that Dan is all about tracking smaller than 10 centimeters. So I'm going to give him the chance to tell us how it's actually going to get uh, worse, uh, in, in a sense, maybe, uh, um, with, with his tracking. So, yeah, at this point, I want to see, you know, uh, who, who uh, from the other guests wants to go ahead and, and give us opinions about, about, about this so far. Go ahead, Dan. I don't know if I can raise my hand. But, uh, yeah, the, just uh, to build on that, uh, what we say, the small debris problem, they, there's actually – hundreds of thousands of additional pieces of debris out there. We take more of the space traffic safety point of view. And so we're pushing forward to, to track two centimeter sized objects. So we think uh, we're not too far away from uh, adding 250,000 new objects to that catalog. So there's about 15,000 tracked in low Earth orbit today. It'll go up to about 250,000. So for space traffic safety purposes, it means about 95% of the risk just isn't in the calculation today. People aren't avoiding it. Um, and not being an optical person, I don't know exactly how that translates to, to kind of the light pollution problem. Um, but as Mariva said, there's uh, certainly gonna be a kind of larger problem pretty soon here. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, Meredith, I was also kind of struck by uh, your comment about, oh, you know, you put these telescopes on the sky and all of a sudden you see all these satellites, all the space debris. That kind of that actually goes back to our um, kind of founding story in in a way that I didn't appreciate till I heard you say it. Um, the uh, the radar experts that we work with, um, I got linked up with them at a research lab we used to work at because one day they they walked down the hall and they said, you know, you're trying to track satellites. Let us show you our research data. And they had a bunch of radars focused up on space to study the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere, and it looked like there was snow driving through the data or rain. And it was all satellites and space debris. And they'd actually spent a number of years perfecting the software to identify that, cut it out of their data and throw it away because it was, it, it was noise in the data. Um, but at the same time, we had a bunch of CubeSat companies coming to us saying, help, I've lost my satellite. You know, can you help me track it? So we turned it around and you know, launched a business. Our, our hearts are still in the, the research side, but you know, we launched a business to actually do the tracking. And we're building radars like, what's in the behind me in the in the background to actually track all that debris so so kind of interesting parallels there but uh i'm not sure it necessarily points the direction to a solution you know as you mentioned the the optical one's kind of different the um radio astronomers have been dealing with spectrum issues you know for a number of years a number of decades and um they they kind of found a path forward but it, it's certainly easier to look back on history and understand how it happened than, than forward to understand where the solution's coming from so, so let me ask you this question, Dan. I mean, um, since, since, since we still have you kind of chatting, um, do, you have, do you have, what are your feelings about uh, how this impacts the astronomy community? I mean, clearly, we're not gonna stop launching stuff. So what do you think mm -hmm. needs to happen? Yeah, you know, I agree with you that I don't think we're gonna start launching stuff. And in fact, it's this kind of interesting progression that the economy and society is now kind of stepping outwards. And, uh, you know, I guess um, in a lot of scientific cases, it's kind of different instruments have to go to quieter parts of the world. And as the economy expands, that people kind of move. But um, this is a big move. So, you know, it's not, uh, frankly, I'm more in the kind of listen mode and understand here. I'm not sure I've got a solution to put forward, but um, for, and certainly not for the, the large instruments. Um, so I've, I was 
kind of curious to hear more about what the technical solutions were. The other, but the other thought that had crossed my mind, and I think this is for a different category of instrument, is you know the space industry lately has been all about bringing down the costs, and is that going to lead to a larger number of space-based telescopes? And you know, I know now, uh, in a way, looking further down the road, but um, that's just one of the things running through the back of my mind is, can we get those cost um, cost savings applied to those telescopes? Start proliferating those, and maybe in a way get to a um, a, a darker patch of space. Um, so maybe okay. I'll stop there. But well, well, well so, so it looks like Doug 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 has his hand raised. So let's let's go with what Doug wants to say. Doug. Sorry, I had my I have my my dual my dual mute, so I had only one of my two mutes off. Um, so, <laughs> my dog was barking in the background. Um, uh, so um, one of the uh, so one of the things I think it was it's first of all great to be here with you. Thank you for for doing this. I think there's an interesting contrast between what Dan just told us and what Meredith just told us, and I think um, uh, certainly we could have opinions on this, but I think there's some very important facts that we probably don't know yet. Um, so. As Dan said, we know there are at least um, 250,000 objects um, in low Earth orbit that are greater than one centimeter, um, and that's we've we've calculated that from surveys that have been done through other instruments um, like Haystack or the Long Dwell Long Debris Experiment Exposure Experiment. Um, but obviously, we don't see those objects um, most of the time because their albedo is either too small or they are physically too small or a combination of the two of those things, right? On the other hand, as Meredith said, um, you know, the SpaceX guys were surprised um, by just how bright their objects are. So I think, I think maybe, um, maybe the folks at SpaceX who were surprised uh, were probably not the folks who designed the satellites. So most, most people who design satellites know exactly how bright they're going to be because it's critical for thermal balance in order to figure out how many, how, what, th how you have to thermal balance the satellite. You have to know exactly how much light is hitting the satellite and how much is reflected off in order to do thermal balance. So, um, but, but nonetheless, I think we all were, you know, the first time we saw a train of, of, um, of uh, SpaceX satellites come across the sky, I think we were all um, a, a little bit, uh, a little bit stunned. Um, obviously, as they've gotten higher, those trains have spread out and are less, uh, are, are less um, pronounced. But the question is, is where's the cutoff? Because clearly we don't see the 250,000 objects that Dan is talking about. And, and they have been up there, those 250,000 objects have been up there for the last uh, 20, 30 years. And clearly they have not interfered with astronomy, right? Um, on the other hand, we clearly know that these larger objects uh, are gonna interfere with astronomy. And, and one of the, and, and by the way, uh, at least you forget these new objects that are being launched are all coordinated in their place in space. So they're regularized in how they come through, which makes them even more prominent um, than random pieces of debris going through at the angles. Do we know, so the question is, and um, do we know yet just how dim or how small or how far away objects need to be in order to not suffer the consequences we're talking about? Um, because it's not, you know, I, I have not seen that yet and i'm and you know as as a person who deals in in policy one of the critical things about passing good policy is having good facts um and and right now i seem we seem to be lacking in those a, a little bit so ha, have we started to do that meredith i guess you're probably the, most that's literally exactly this. what this conference is about this week is, uh -huh. is trying to actually get some concrete policy suggestions written down like that are well researched and well founded and hopefully clearly written so mm -hmm. uh we have draft reports right now um with like if there's 17 suggestions um for everything from making them darker that actually we want lower orbits, uh, mm -hmm. which might be counterintuitive, but they're yeah. not visible for as long if they're lower and they're also moving right. faster. So then they don't mm -hmm. have a chance to make as bright of a streak if they're zipping past. Mm -hmm. um, and they also are less in focus, so it's spread out so the peak brightness is lower. Um, right. But lower orbits though, are crowded orbits, I know is a big pushback that we get. Um, and also I think, I guess it's, and again, this is veering outside of my area of expertise, but I guess that if you are launching something, it's a little harder to settle into a lower orbit or something. Yeah, too, too, so too low. So there's a lot you, of other considerations. Too. Right, too low, you don't stay there very long. Yeah, too, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, too low is no go. Too low is no go. But, but, I, but I, what I wanted to do is I just, Elena, I want to involve you. Uh, I, I, see, I see you there. And, and, and as, our, uh, 
as, as our, our uh, lawyer environmentalist, I want you to weigh in on some of this stuff. Yeah, I, I feel like a social scientist in the in the room. Uh, well, it's it's also a bit difficult. So, from a from a legal perspective, as as you know, through a number of ongoing projects and debates out there right now, we have lots of gaps. Things have not been defined properly at the time when, for example, the Outer Space Treaty came into force. Um, it doesn't have it doesn't even have a very clear definition of space debris. I mean, I'm thinking. It, if you, the closest is Article 8, if we can think of that. But beyond uh, just the definition of space debris or space objects, there is also the broader issue of the use of uh, orbit, the orbit and outer space, depending on w which activity we're uh, referring to. So it is, at the moment, it has a status of the common heritage of original world is, uh, world is mankind, uh, the global commons. So, we can update that, uh, but uh, so there's this. So are the activities that are taking place over there right now for the benefit of all humankind? And so there are two arguments, right? So there's there's the argument that uh, we need all these satellites for all kinds of things, including let's say monitoring of climate change or providing internet to everyone. But then also, who is launching the satellites? Who is participating? Who's not participating? Not all states and have the same capacity, of course. So we're going back actually to a similar argument that we had, um, what is it now, 60, 70 years ago, just in, in, reaction, in, in relation to commons in general. In fact, maybe even older, all the way back to 17th century when we were discussing the seas. So how do we access, like all the way to Grotius, 1609 and you know, the free seas, who has a right to um, be in the free seas and how to utilize them. So there are a lot of parallels and similarities, I would say, um, in, in, in um, how we're dealing with the poles, uh, the Arctic and Antarctic, of course, uh, the deep seas, etc. But then there is an extra component, um, who is actually, who are the primary actors right now? And so there is this kind of state commercial nexus that is taking, that, it, that, is, that has a prominence but is not very clear in law because outer space law is primarily focused on the responsibility of, or not primarily, only <laughs> focused on responsibility of states. So attribution of all activities goes back to the state. So we do have a, 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 an enormous gap, but beyond that, there is also the kind of conceptual, epistemological question. Um, thank you, Mori, about uh, earlier there, for the connection with the colleague in Australia, because now there, we are also discussing how, how do we all see space? <laughs> your, your your initial experience, like the little narrative. I mean, it, it you know we all have different relations to space. Some are, I'm I'm not a scientist. Uh, I I I mean, but even as a social scientist, there's kind of this deeper, even philosophical, if not even theological question. What what is it in relation to us? And then the, the entire non-human. Um, so as you know, I've I, my, I've started doing quite a lot on just the the idea of our relationship to the non-human, both on Earth and then the outer space. When I say non-human in outer space, I don't mean aliens. I mean... <laughs> I I'm mean, glad you clarified that, uh, Elena, yeah. because you know... It's, yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, but this is... Okay, you know, I'm going to go back. Uh, I, I, this is what I always like to do even with, with, uh, with lots of talks. I like to go back in time because I really have a feeling that we're... Or not, I'm not having this feeling. In fact, this has been increasingly recognized that they were having similar discussions that we had, you know, five, six hundred years ago. Uh, who, 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 what is, what, what, what do we, how do we use? So first of all, if we go with, the, you know, the anthropocentric approach that human uses spaces. So, you know, if, if to, to give you a parallel on Earth, like John Locke will, will have ar argued that, you know, there are certain appropriate uses of land. So in, in North America, if you have proper agricultural use of land with settlements and everything, then that's acceptable. If you're just a nomadic tribe roaming, then you're not really there. That's, you know, we have the, the terra nullius uh, concept in international law that it's not even inhabited. So, you know, what are the appropriate uses? And so now we have, we, we have uh, let's say, the astronomers here, we have commercial actors there, we have, you know, the people on the earth there, but then we also have the space. 
we, we also have this space that, that um, I've never been there, <laughs> but, and I'm not supposed to be there even, like I'm not, technically I'm not supposed to, like let's say just me, my body physically is not supposed to survive there. And it, act, and it moves and it acts by different laws. And so those are the things that at least in some philosophical circles have been a question for quite some time the the our non the non-human laws like when you were i was just listening to everything that everyone was saying um i know very little about these things so i shall refrain and not to embarrass myself but the laws of physics laws of chemistry laws of all these you know laws of bio biological laws which all which govern us on earth as well so that's what i mean when i say by non-human so there there is there is a whole bunch of stuff moving and acting and um, that's what we mean, like the, the, this, everything that's outside of the human and how it acts and how then it impacts the human. So we do things, we have positive and negative consequences of those things, like for example, climate change. And then the climate change comes back to us. <laughs> things that happen that affect us and our bodies and our lives and so on. So that, that's what I mean by non-human agency. And, by, and then when, the moment that I uttered the word agency, uh, there are all kinds of academic circles that will just kind of say, what do you mean by agency? Mm -hmm. you know, and then that, that goes, again, thousands of years of, of discussion of who, who can act, what, what do we recognize as having agency? What do we recognize as acting? And what do we recognize as important as well? So yeah, I, th I, 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 think, I think, Elena, I think all those are uh, very interesting points, especially uh, highlighting that, you know, we've, We've been here before in terms of some of these things uh, have, have come up and, and uh, who has agency and, and yeah, and, and the different uses. I think, look, the outer, clearly the Outer Space Treaty is like the Magna Carta for, 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 for space, but we need to do more. We need to do better. Uh, when you talk about unintended consequences, just like, you know, Meredith uh, started off with saying, yeah, people were surprised at how bright these things were. It's like, that's an unintended consequence, right? It's like, they didn't do anything illegal, but there's this unintended consequence, and it's 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 almost like, it's almost like um, you know, was there any way to kind of even predict that this could have happened? And I think that um, we tend to just be very much out in front of the headlights, and 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 just go go go, and then uh, very reactive to say, oh well, you know, I didn't I didn't think this would happen. I didn't mean for it to happen. It's like well. Did you slow down enough to even consider what 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 these things uh, might be? And so I think I think one of my major issues with the whole way that we do stuff in space is that different uh, entities tend to be extremely insular and not very inclusive of even consideration of what the effects and impacts might be to others. Uh, and say, hey, you know, if if I can do this and it's legal, I'm just going to do it. But that said, I, I want to give I want to give an opportunity. Go ahead, go ahead, Elena. I was just going to say the legal. The, so we can do this in Q and A later as well. The legality thing. Uh, there are also different ways to approach this, right? There is liability convention. There is a general international law idea of fault, like and and you know various definitions of how you're supposed to behave, not just well, obviously in the orbit, but anywhere. <laughs> so so those things are not entirely relevant. I just think that this is kind of new for a lot of people and also has been very isolated to certain kinds of scientific communities, even legal communities, even if you think outer space law, it's not necessarily the most popular <laughs> or present uh, section of international law and people sometimes just don't know. So it's taking some time for things to be out there in the public and the debate. Absolutely. Um, and one other quick thought, uh, you yeah. know, I think we're actually seeing space become a more transparent environment. You know, we're kind of, there's more, there's more eyes on kind of what's going on. And maybe that didn't happen in the past. Uh, Bri, but you mentioned that uh, it was almost like in the past, it was you launched something into space and it was kind of out of sight, out of mind. You know, if you were operating the satellite, you kind of knew what was going on, but maybe nobody else cared. Uh, the radio astronomers were probably the first to take note because it's, you know, it, it interfering with their instrument. Um, now optical astronomers, it's interfering uh, with them. But there's also a, a big space debris problem as well. And it's kind of something we harp on, which is the information about what's going on is going to get out there now. And it needs to be driven into things like evidence-based policymaking. You know, the facts are going to become very rapidly known. And 
I hope that accelerates the development of better policies or policies that kind of better match the current environment. But, you know, we're kind of, we're talking about kind of various different speeds of development of things. And this tech satellite technology side is kind of way out in the lead in terms of speed. And everyone else is trying to figure out how to catch up or accelerate or, or react. So it's an in interesting environment. Um, but uh, I think with, with more facts, we're hopefully able to start to find some more nuanced answers and actually find ways to make these different systems coexist. Yeah. I, I mean, hey, yeah, go ahead, Doug. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say there's a, there's a question in the, in the Q and a that I think is, is very interesting uh, to talk about this. And this is it's from Anushka Sharma. If I pronounced that right. And if I didn't, I, I apologize. Yeah. Well, um, so, so, well, so, so it, can, we, can we get Anushka uh, on board so that she can uh, interact with us, Torsten? Let's see if we can. If there she, there, she's if we coming. Can. There. Okay, good. Yeah. Anushka, you are now a panelist, so you can open your mic and your camera if you want. By the way, I love the symbol, Anushka. Hi. Okay. I can see, um, get into camera. <laughs> Um, is this the AI question I asked? Uh, no, actually, it was the whose responsibility is to convene government space agencies. I thought that was a... a hey, great... Anushka. Ah, yeah, yeah. So why, why I was not ahead? expecting that at all. <laughs> so, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm sorry to... <laughs> sorry to take on you. Yeah, yeah, we're just going with the flow. It's live here. It's dynamic. So yeah, why don't you just go ahead and ask what you want? Go ahead. Yeah. So I love the conversation today. And Maria, but I love your style of like convening everyone. But my question was, is like, whose responsibility is it to convene governments, actors in like satellite manufacturing, um, the astronomers and citizens like me who just want to be able to like look up and see Mars when it's at its closest position to Earth now? Um, how do we like hold all these different actors to account? Like, w are we creating a new model? Like, is this a new system? Like, is this a new identity? And I find that so much in the whole like ethical conversation around space and our future. Oh God, I'm so nervous. I'm like shaking. <laughs> <laughs> but like the work I do with Nort is I'm really thinking about trying to convene like a board of ethics for space. But that only just touches on the space debris issue. It doesn't even touch on like the plethora of other issues we all need to be involved with. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? How do we do it? But one so, resource that immediately comes to mind that I really, uh, I don't know, I think that they're awesome, I'll put it that way, is <laughs> the uh, Just Space Alliance. This is a couple of astronomers who, um, I can see if I can find the link, uh, who basically think about these things a lot and write very smart things about it. Um, and they are, I'm not sure if it's like a consulting group or exactly how they would pitch themselves, um, but I will put the link to that um, in the chat. We can you share know, the link with the, with the thank you emails then later on. You know, Marie, one of the reasons I, I, I put, uh, put Anushka on the spot, and I apologize for Anushka, and by the way, you did, you did great, fantastic. Um, so it was because I think that is that what you've asked is the key question. That is the key question, is whose responsibility is. And you know, it's funny, I, you know, I live in Washington, D.C., and I, um, I used to walk uh, into the Capitol building uh, routinely to talk to congressmen and senators about different uh, issues for space. And, but every time I did that, I had to park down the street and I walked by this one yard, which had a sign in the front yard. Uh, and it said, every great thing started with one person taking action. Um, and, and it's so right, right? And, and so, for example, right now we have one person taking action here, Mariba, who's brought us all together to talk about this thing. Um, and, and what I have found in, as I've looked through history, and I, and I love the fact that Elena quoted us history um, uh, because it's so important for us to learn from, most of, most of these things grow up because individual people, not even necessarily government officials, but individual people decide that they want to take on a challenge um, like this uh, to go ahead and uh, and address it. Uh, I'm sure you know Meredith's, Meredith's group that she talked that she's talking to. I'm sure is a an informal uh, group, um, and yet we'll still come out with some policy recommendations. And and you know they may they may make their way to the zeitgeist. They may go ahead and, um, and instead just be uh, left on a shelf somewhere. But all of us have a have a a, a, a contribution to make. And I, and I find that it's what I always find is 
we all think that we can't have an impact, and yet we can. Um, it's, ama it's actually amazing how much a single citizen can do um, if you choose to do it. Um, this is, Mariba knows this is one of the, one of the things that I, that I care about greatly, and not just light pollution, but all space traffic management, as Daniel was talking about, um, debris and all the other things in space. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll go ahead and, and tell a tale on Mariba and me. I mean, right now we're in discussions with a foreign nation um, on, uh, on just a bilateral basis, on talking about these kind of issues in a very informal forum, trying to go ahead and make progress. Uh, but this, you know, these problems don't get solved because we look to somebody else to solve them. They get solved because we decide that we're going to go ahead and, and get them solved. So, so I encourage you to, to, to get involved in that. I, I can tell you that myself and other folks on here are going to be involved in this problem. Um, and I really, uh, and I really do, I want to go back to what I said earlier. I really want to understand what, how big this problem is. Cause I, I, I just don't understand it right now. You know, if I look up in the sky and I see a satellite passing by, it's less than probably one hundredth of an arc second that it takes up in the sky at any one point. Right. Um, and, um, and by the way, for those of you who are in scientists, arc seconds is not a measure of time. It's a measure of, <laughs> it's a measure of size. Um, so, um, but, um, uh, but, but uh, I want to understand how big of a problem that's going to be. Dan talked about radio astronomy. We had a huge problem in radio astronomy in the 60s and the 70s when we started launching satellites, but we figured out how to go ahead and get around it. And we're going to have to figure that, figure that out. And, and eventually those become rules. Eventually they become rules. But they start out with people understanding and talking and discussing these things. So I think it's very, it's very important that we're doing this today and we'll continue to do this. And that's all I want to say. I just wanted to like quickly just say the understanding part and I think that's that part is actually crucial because I would argue that at the moment there isn't that much understanding just even within the legal community if you're speaking to like a corporate lawyer here the environmental lawyer there other space lawyer person there they are not necessarily speaking to each other let alone other disciplines so me even listening to everything that you just explained and just different uh, cultures, people, position. I mean, this is why this particular initiative is so important. Actual access to that discussion. I think that's great. Anushka, how do you feel with these answers? Is this cool? You know what? I love it. And thank you all so much. And also for putting me in the spot, because sometimes it's so easy to like, number one, hide behind the scenes and like um, being a part of the conversation is so important. So thank you. But I have one idea. Um, Mariba, we met at a space risk um, conference in London a couple of years ago, and you gave a keynote about space debris. And one of the things I did at a later event was run a moot. So that's like the fake kind of lawyers kind of going through a case. What about Elena, if we get the actors that you mentioned that don't have access to the conversation and run an event like this, where we put them in a scenario where they give their like insights. I don't know. I feel like that was a really good way of getting people thinking through. Um, we didn't really have that for dealing with COVID, but we've had to go through like those sorts of systems thinking. I'm throwing it out there and leaving it and I seeing how I can help bring that together with you all. Well, so, yeah, I think, I, think, I think that's a great idea and I want you to like hit me up later and maybe we can follow up on that. Okay. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you Take so well. much. All right. All right. Booyah. <laughs> So, so, so I think, um, you know, somebody who tends to be uh, highly, highly opinionated at all these things, I'm glad that I see them here. I want to put them on the spot is Michael Maloney. This guy, every time I, I, I'm given a talk, I see him in the crowd. He's got lots of questions. So why don't we, why don't we, why don't we bring Michael onto the stage and, and see what he's got to say? Done. Michael, you're on the panel. You just have to unmute yourself and put on your camera if you like. Okay. Now I'm on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we roll, bro. That's how we roll, man. Thanks, good, thing, good, thing you dre good thing you didn't have your pajamas on, Michael. Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my pajamas on. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Great. So uh, you're talking about my questions. I have lots of them. 
I, I know you do. We, we probably many can serve. all of them, but I, I, want you to, I want to give you an opportunity to inter interact with the guests here, man. Go ahead. Well, thank you so much. Um, my real question there was, uh, you know, we have a gap uh, between, you know, how much observation we need to do um, and how much we're doing. And, you know, I spent years uh, working in the space industry with built satellites and constellations and that sort of thing when I was at Laurel and uh, at Lockheed. And we never thought about this stuff. We just, it, we just put it up there. The question was, can you build something this big? Can it be this powerful? Can you make this connection? Can you talk to these people? Can you get this data rate? You know, those are the things we were concerned with. It was never, how long are they going to be there? How do we get them down? Uh, who's, you know, what way are we in and anybody's viewing of the world? And, uh, and so those were the things we were solving years ago. We're living with those decisions today. So I was on a Kwajalein uh, in the South Pacific and we were doing uh, some uh, space surveillance at the time. And uh, so my question is, you know, you know, what's the gap? We have to have an understanding. We know what the size of the, of the debris is. So how many more sensors, how many more observations? I mean, this is quantifiable, we should know this. And, and somewhere there's this number of sensors and locations and observations we get to where we finally understand exactly what's up there and what it's doing. And then we need to do the longitudinal surveys to answer your question more about is, you know, what does this stuff do over time? We've got all this debris out there. We've allocated this resource to debris. Debris is an unconstrained user of space. And we've allocated a certain proportion of space to it. We don't know what it is. So how can we do space traffic management if we can't quantify how much is left over for us to use and, and manage all of that? Because we're not managing orbits. We, manage, we don't manage trajectories. We manage spectrum. There's, there's no constraint on any orbital body because, well, it's just physics. <laughs> so we live with this environment and unfortunately I think that the big the crucial issue and, and, and Doug kind of touched on this is and, and others have touched on this is where's the credibility come from where, where does our credibility come from to go to somebody like the FCC or some other agency and say hey stop you can't do this 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 is a really bad idea and you don't want to do this you know this constellation has to shrink by half um, another question is is okay so I launched uh, a, a constellation and suddenly the environment changes because of a collision. Do we, have, do we have the authority to say, no, you got to deorbit half your satellites now, you're in a crowded space, or you have to change your orbital altitude. Well, you can't do that because their antenna coverages are made for a certain size to cover a certain area for a certain population with a certain throughput, and they, and they can't change their altitude by 300 miles or 200 miles. They've got an optimized system they've designed for all of the various trades they made. Anyway, so I'll stop there. Thank you. I, I, so I, I, I think I think that's good. I think that Dan uh, separately cer certainly has something to say. I, I the last thing that you said, I'll tell you this right. And Mer Meredith uh, brought this up. You know, astronomers want things to be lower because you know they're not reflecting as much uh, light because you know they're going through eclipse and and their movement through the sky is faster. But I don't know. I mean, OneWeb, for instance, you know, they have a pretty high altitude uh, 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 constellation. And it's not clear to me that they're just going to lower lower their constellation by 600 kilometers because of uh, the impact to ground-based astronomy. The other thing that I want to say that I find interesting, and this is not something that I necessarily want answered here, but as an astronomer, Meredith, I'm imagining if I got a research grant to to to, to do astronomy and collect some data, and and I'm impacted by this stuff, I wonder if I could then sue the company to say, hey, I didn't get my research results because you got in the way. <laughs> So anyway, I think that's just kind of uh, maybe may something to, to, to ponder, but, but I'm going to open it up to the, to the rest of, uh, of the guests here to address uh, one or more of what, uh, of what Michael brought up. Yes. So Michael, you know, picking off a piece of what you pointed out, the, um, it, I think there isn't enough information about what's going on today. And as you said, in the past, there's been a very simple view of space. Like we've, it's either in space or it's not in space. You know, and uh, it's not, is it in a sun synchronous orbit? Is it below the space station? Is it above the space station? Is it a certain size constellation or not? So um, the knowledge of space is getting a lot more detailed. And I think it's, it's critical to actually, to, to have a lot more information about where the satellites are, what they're doing, how well the kind of deorbit plans are being followed uh, and the like. And um, you know, the one little piece that uh, I'm focused on, on solving is actually kind of getting getting access to the data. You know, so in the past, data about this sort of thing generally comes only from defense organizations, right. uh, a little bit of scientific data. But the whole the whole business model was a defense organization spends a decade, builds spends a lot of money, builds a radar, 
data comes out for you know the national government and then a little bit gets applied to this problem uh you know we're in the business of actually building out radars around the world a whole network of them so that this data can be much more broadly used and we're actually really focused on regulators and on the insurance industry and, and this topic of exactly what data is needed in terms of the risks to then empower those those new policies and those new decisions and i think we haven't seen as much progress to date in a large part because there's uh, there's been a lack of information. Uh, so, you know, okay. so that's, it's kind of one piece of the problem we're solving. You know, one other thing that was kind of interesting, it clicked when you were talking is space is becoming um, a much more mature, mature environment. You know, in the past, maybe you could launch a system that was highly optimized for only communication, but you know, now you got to take a number of other things into consideration, how you're impacting other people who are in space, how you're impacting them on the ground. Um, the ecosystem of tools you have to use is changing. So, you know, the Leo Labs tracking services are one of them, but there's ground system networks for hire. Hopefully soon there will be active debris removal services, uh, you know, for hire to get rid of your satellites. And so that the, the range of concerns and the range of tools is growing. And, you know, you see it on the ground as something goes from maybe the early research all the way out to becoming like a consumer item, all these additional questions, health and safety and the like, become really important. So we're seeing space go that way, and it's interesting. I, frankly, I just personally find it interesting. Yeah, very cool, thank, thank, thanks for that, Dan. Is any, anybody else uh, on the guests have something to, to, to answer to, to Michael? Yeah. Yeah, Marie Brown, I'll, I'll jump in. And Michael, thanks, uh, thanks for the question and for engaging. It's uh, obviously a very important, uh, very important question. You know, um, <clears throat> we're talking a lot about light pollution today, but you know, and Dan is, and, and you have talked about space traffic management. They kind of go hand in hand. There, there are two sides of the same coin, right? Um, there's more things in space, and there are several, there are several effects that occur from those. One of those effects is light pollution. One of those effects is the likelihood of collision goes up. One of, there's there's certainly other effects. That one of the one of the um, byproducts that nobody has talked about is like when you launch thirty thousand satellites into a into a shell of orbit um, two kilometers wide, you basically have just decided that you own that part of space. Nobody else nobody else can fly there. You're the only ones um, who can who can fly there. Um, <clears throat> and it's in, yeah, and it's interesting. The FCC, who really has no authority over this, but but there were some people there who thought um, at the Federal Communication Commission, for those of you who aren't in America, um, uh, for um, they uh, they they approve all the licensings for frequencies for satellites in the U.S. They actually put together an expansive set of rules um, about how to control this, um, which eventually got uh, torpedoed. Um, for for a whole bunch of reasons, not because the rules were bad, but because folks didn't weren't sure they should be the ones putting those rules together, um, and and probably they shouldn't have been. Um, but the the inter what I found interesting from that is even for folks who really are experts in communication, they put together a pretty good set of rules. Now they didn't cover light pollution in those rules, and so that would be something that we'd want to add in those. Um, but but they but people. We, what we find is people do know sort of what we want to, what we need to do. The biggest problem that I see is that since space is the global commons, as Elena has told us, um, we need international agreement. And one of the things that put the put the rules of the FCC on the back burner was the fact that the U.S. didn't want to constrain itself beyond what other nations were constrained to do, which. I think is a fallacy of logic. I think if you step out and lead, people follow, but that's just me. Um, the, uh, the, but the point is, is that um, we, we have no agreement even whether or not we should manage these things. You know, we're talking about how we manage these things today. There's not even an international agreement that this stuff is worth managing right now, uh, which, is, which I find is, the, is the, the most disturbing of these things. And I'm glad we're having this conversation today. Uh, we, we definitely need to go ahead and get over that hurdle, that these things need to be managed. Um, and, uh, and we have bodies like COPUS that do that and others that do that. But this is really gonna take all the spacefaring nations to really get together. And I remind people all the time that during the height of World War II, all the um, nations in the world who had active aircraft industries 
got together and signed the Chicago Conventions, agreeing on how do you regulate air transport during the middle of World War II. Um, so if we can't all get together um, as spacefaring nations, of which there are really only 20 or 30 spacefaring nations of, uh, of uh, worth uh, worth mentioning, and we can't get together and agree on this, then we're just not pushing hard enough. And and we should all be asking our governments and our um, our informal non-governmental bodies to really push for this. Let's let's go ahead and really push, getting together and agreeing that we're going to do something about this. That's that's my feeling. Thank you, Doug. So Anyone I think else? it's interesting. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think it's. It... No, go ahead. <laughs> Interesting that you focus specifically on spacefaring nations, um, because while for sure that those are the players who have the ability to launch the stuff, um, it, it impacts everyone. And I, I wanted to kind of circle back to what Elena said earlier about um, an analogy to like the open seas or whatever you called it, like back when, you know, uh, Western nations were sending out folks in boats and being like, what's out there, you know, I, that's a fascinating analogy, because I, I really fear that we're going to turn into some kind of colonizing space situation in like the worst possible sense of the word. And I don't think that is the future that we should hope for and work for. And I think we should work against that kind of a thing where there's only a few people who get to dictate what happens. Uh, I was at a, a recent conference um, for astronomers that's kind of a, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, it's, it's basically a whole bunch of astronomers and related folks who want to make cool stuff happen on the internet. Uh, is how it started, but it's kind of branched out a little bit. It's called dot astronomy. And uh, like almost the entire like subtext for this meeting that was virtual a couple months ago was about satellites because it was like the new thing everyone was talking mm -hmm. about. What was interesting is we had a participant um, from Namibia who's not an astronomer, but she works on ground, um, like observing stuff from satellites, like ground cover for like ecology, like tracking populations of animals and stuff that I super don't know a lot about, but it was fascinating. And, uh, and she joined some of the satellite conversations and she said, well, you know, can they help us? Can they send us data? And we, we're like, oh, wait, no, they don't have cameras on them. Like this is literally just for internet access and, and she hadn't heard of it. And no one in her communities was like aware that these companies were planning to provide like, you know, worldwide internet access at an affordable rate. So I, I have a deep questions and concerns about um, whether or not the nominal services that these uh, constellations are gonna provide are actually gonna be a net good um, when there's a lot of harm attached to them as well. And I think that's like what gets left out of these legal conversations and these like spacefaring nations conversations is like really all of the different people who are going to be affected who don't even know about this yet and haven't had an opportunity to, to say what they need or, or would prefer. Yeah, Meredith, don't, uh, uh, great, great point. Thank you. And don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that a few should make the rules for the many um, uh, at all. Uh, but what I have found is, because I've been doing this so long, is when we get in a room of, of 208 nations, um, we can't agree on anything. Um, and, um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's the, we, we all, for example, today talk about how great the Outer Space Treaty is. The Outer Space Treaty was negotiated by three nations, the United States, Russia, and, and uh, the UK, um, and uh, adopted by the world. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not that I'm trying to exclude anybody. Um, it's just that I, that I, I'm, I at least perhaps I'm chastened by experience, which is terrible. Um, but but every, the smaller the group is, and you, you can come up with with suggestions, and and that's not to that's not to restrict others. It's to try to go ahead and make progress. And so it's that I think it's this balance, right? It's the how many people need to be in the conversation in order to make progress, knowing that if everybody's in the conversation, progress is almost impossible, which is what we've proven um, over the last 25 years um, in. Uh, in the first committee in the UN. It's, we've made zero progress on this, um, which is so frustrating to me. I've been through multiple UN conferences. I finally got so so uh, frustrated at the last one I was at. I, and, and, I, and I said, look, you guys, are, you guys don't care about, you just care about making arguments. You don't care about making progress. I, I care about making progress. Um, so, so that's why, I, that, that's why I, I take the lesson from history where we only got the international air carriers who were interested in it, the 55 nations of the Chicago Convention together, um, which, by the way, at the time, did not include either the Soviet Union or, or, or now Russia and China. They didn't sign on until 25, 30 years later um, to those same conventions. And yet, uh, and yet they found that the rules did make sense for them as well. So anyway. I just have a follow-up 
to that a very quick one or maybe not that quick um so the uh, the one of the pro i, I mean is, um, not everyone says that our space treaty is great and actually for that precise that reason because we're living with a cold war instrument um same as with unclos the the un conventional law of the sea they were negotiated around the same time but around the same people there's quite a lot of history actually on, again me and history but if you actually sit down and read quite a lot of debates of what was being said in the 60s there are again a lot of similarities and there is a cold war and partially that's also why we we do have a problem right now because we have that kind of looming uh, image over ourselves that we need to leave behind. Another one is um, also what I'm thinking of the law of the sea. We do have very specific, for example, rules on how companies, because th this is another thing that, that maybe we shouldn't uh, lose sight of, and it, it's this kind of state company and, and who participates in the lawmaking. So we have very specific rules, for example, how companies could get licensed to do, let's say, deep sea mining. But that is all still being criticized because, for example, the ISA, the uh, International Seabed Agency, so is, is giving uh, way too many licenses right now, and we have environmental issues and uh, questions coming from other corners. And I really, sorry, because I really, I was inspired by a comment that I'm reading here, and I want to address it, traditional knowledge, traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples. And that goes to the participation. Historically, so, they are not state, not historic, they are just not states. So at the, see, these international debates, they were never present. They weren't present on many things that, that, influ that do affect their lives. And there is, especially in kind of environmental uh, questions that we're dealing with right now, not just climate change, but you know, pandemics, <laughs> things like that. Um, there is this question of you know, how we approach the knowledge and how we approach the law. So yes, it's much easier to um, have uh, consensus, uh, although consensus building and making can also be put into question who's in the room, who speaks, who doesn't speak and so on with, with a smaller group. But so many have been ex excluded historically and we do see as a consequence of that some very tangible uh, problems, I would argue. No, I, 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 think, I think those are excellent points, Elena. I love, as you, as you know, in, in my own work, uh, I try to build it foundationally on, on uh, traditional ecological knowledge as, as a, a way to, to try to achieve space sustainability. So I agree uh, 110%. Um, I, see, I see Torsten is reminding us of, of time, time left to go, about 12 more minutes here. I want to give uh, Wakar... Uh, th thanks, Michael uh, Maloney, for, for, for coming on stage. Uh, maybe, Wakar, if uh, you want to come on stage, because I see that uh, you've been upvoted several times by people in, in, in a question that you want to ask. So maybe uh, to wrap up, just give Wakar a chance to come on stage real quick, and then we can, uh, we can call this he, first session of Chillin' uh, good. He is off already. Oh, he already left? Yep. Oh, okay, okay. Um, in that case... Oh, he is here. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. Sorry, Walkar, you are on stage now. Hey guys, uh, thank you for giving me the stage. Thank you, Mariva, for uh, allowing me to talk here. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> um, so yeah, my question was regarding space sustainability. I should pro probably Google what it means um, before asking the question in this forum. Uh, but, but really, it, it, it comes down to what I believe is uh, transparency and reducing uncertainty. And um, my question to the um, forum is, transparency doesn't necessarily mean getting the truth. So getting the truth means, you know, getting more observations and working towards reducing that uncertainty. Should the latter have some cost associated with it? And who should, uh, who should uh, that cost be burdened to? Should it be shared worldwide? Or do we look at one entity that's gonna help solve that problem? That's what I <laughs> I'm not going to try to answer that one. That, that's why you guys are here. You know what I'm saying? I'm, 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 yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, uh, a, a couple of thoughts on that. Good, good question, and you know, it's certainly near and dear to to many of our hearts. I, um, to me, it transparency is certainly a. It to me, it's a piece of the problem, and and on top of the transparency, it's it's kind of validated information, verified information, cross checked information, so that you know exactly what's what's going on uh, in space. And I think you know we see it in a lot of other domains that you want more data, but. Uh, it's not always it's not always good. So you've got to you really got to focus on the data quality as well. Um, but I think the transparency is just kind of the foundation of some of these other questions, like the policies and and the practices and ultimately the laws. So um, it, it's the state of the space industry that transparency hasn't been the norm. So you know we're pushing into that realm. But then on top of that, the policy has to be built. So I, I, maybe that's where my expertise ends. You know, kind of as as engineers, uh, we're we're out there building the radars, building the 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 data systems to to kind of power those later later steps in the process. You know, Mariba, um, I, I think um, it's uh, and 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 Wakar, a great uh, great question, by the way. Um, it's really it's really interesting, um, folks. The the things that Dan is doing are things that scared the U.S. government ten years ago. I mean, they, they were, they, they, there were people in the U.S. government who were trying to outlaw what Dan is doing. Um, I had to argue with folks in Congress that, no, this is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's very interesting how that, that has actually changed uh, now significantly. Um, but, Ricardo, the question of, you know, who should pay for this, this is, this is a, uh, one of the, this is a great question. Um, as most of you know, uh, when you um, when you go ahead and buy an airline ticket, about twenty percent of the cost is um, is overhead that the the airline company has to pay to the U.S. government to maintain uh, traffic services, airports, um, and all the other things that go that go into creating an air traffic model. We have not done that with space. Um, you know, so SpaceX. Well, I'm going to make up a number. SpaceX will go ahead and make five billion dollars a year off of a free spectrum license. It actually costs a half million dollars to, re to request a spectrum license. So, so off of a basically free half um, spectrum license, SpaceX will go ahead and make a billions of dollars a year um, off, of their, uh, off of their Starlink constellation. Should we have gone ahead and say, you know, you have a responsibility to make sure that we can track it, that you deliver the data on exactly where your satellites are, not down to a five kilometer bubble, which we don't, which means that we can't tell what's going to collide, but down to a, down to within 10, 10 meters of the actual location of the satellite. We, these are policies again, which we, the United States could do just uh, for our own manufacturers. Um, and of course, as, as I said earlier, I, I like to do things internationally as well, but we have been so afraid to take the, to take the traditional methods we've paid for these public services, um, which we have, which are well understood in maritime law, in aviation law, every one of those transportation services, they all pay taxes on the, on the things that keep them um, going as, in a safe environment, whether it's port, port access or whatever. We haven't done that for space. Uh, and Elena's right, it's because we wrote the Outer Space Treaty with too much of a, with too much of a Cold War mentality about what we, we didn't want to restrict rather than how we want to go ahead and make space a more beneficial place for everybody. So I, I agree with Elena, the history of the Outer Space Treaty is very, is very interesting. But we, know, we today have the, have the benefit of the knowledge of knowing those mistakes happened. Um, and we have the benefit of history knowing what we've done in other domains. So to me, I think this is a solvable problem. Uh, we, just have to, we just have to go ahead and go and start to act on it. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Doug, Wakar. I appreciate it. Uh, since, since, since we're finalizing here, um, um, I want to just give uh, everybody one, one, one chance to kind of go around any last, last things you want to say before we, we shut down session one of, of N, where hopefully N is a large number. Hey, maybe just to, just to say thanks for the opportunity here, Mariba. It's uh, space is continues to get more and more interesting and more and more complicated. So it's really nice to be in a situation where we can talk to people who are coming at this from all different angles. And uh, I completely agree with what was said before. It's all these sorts of interactions, all these different groups uh, working forward uh, and pushing forward are gonna gonna make meaningful impact. So thanks for having us. Thank you, Dan. 
I was just going to say it's this is a great I think this is a great forum. Hopefully more and more people will join and watch. So thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Yeah, from from me as well, Reba, thank you, thank you for doing this and, and thanks for everybody, both the, the folks who are listening and the folks on the panel for for participating. And and I and I want to go back just to where I started. I really am interested, Meredith, in learning more about this problem um, because because it's one of those areas where I, I just ha I have a personal blind spot, um, um, which I guess is double entendre. Um, but uh, um, uh, about about how um, how uh, difficult and this issue is, and I, I think it I think this is one of those ones where um, we have an opportunity now to go ahead and uh, start laying out. Uh, the actual facts so we can make good decisions. So thank you for bringing those things up. Booyah. Meredith. Yeah, I, I hope you're right. I hope that these conversations can can move us in that direction. Uh, it's certainly heartening to be in a, a virtual room with uh, not just a bunch of astronomers who are worrying about their sensors. Uh, that, that's the uh, the narrow scope that I tend to be uh, involved in. So it's, it's great to hear some history and uh, some radio and just all these different contexts uh, is really great. I, I do think that one area that I might be able to, I found it really interesting and surprising that the to get an FCC um, like approval to launch a bunch of satellites, you get to waive the environmental review if you're launching satellites. And this is something that I only recently learned. And again, you know, I'm an astronomer, not a FCC expert lawyer person. Um, but I think that might be an avenue worth pursuing. It's just this whole giant regime of lots of different complicated players and unintended consequences. So I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad that we're thinking about it and talking about it and hopefully uh, able to make some real change. Thank you, Marisa. Thanks. So, so th thanks to everybody. Before I turn it uh, back to Torsten, I want to thank everybody uh, for, for, for putting your name in the hat, for, for being part of this initial session. I think it's so cool that we can just have this kind of candid conversation that's very transdisciplinary. Uh, that's what we needed to be. And uh, rightly called people's voice and bringing people uh, that, are, that are attending to be on stage with us and kind of chat about these things. That's what needs to happen. So, uh, I'm very moved, and, and I'm 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 actually uh, uh, so happy uh, 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 with this first session. And like I said, uh, we're gonna have many more, and and Torsten's gonna get to that. So so with that, thank you, Torsten. Yeah, thank you. And I think it was a, a great kickoff. And uh, if we get the slides from the production, then um, I will talk about some new formats that we are planning. Our uh, on the 12th of November, our, our Space Cafe Black Ops by Ralph Thiele will then start. Uh, this format will focus on defense and military space and hybrid warfare. Um, this first episode um, will discuss LEO and MEO defense applications. So I think that's also a topic that is very interesting and just a few people are talking about, or if ever. Um, then the next episode of the Morios Fox Populi, and unless we get our unless you tell us it's, it wasn't worse uh, to, to be here, but I think uh, the impression was a different one. It was a great forum. So it's planned for the 3rd of uh, December, uh, just to uh, put it in your calendar. And the normal uh, webinars that we are run are the uh, Space Cafe Web Talks, the short 33 minutes one-to-one uh, -one person things are on next week, or I will talk with Juan de Damao, the president of the ISU, about space careers. On the 20th of October, I'm looking forward to talk to Professor Ram Jaku, the acting director of McGill University in Canada, uh, on the need of more space policy and space law. So he was so brave to raise this question, this, this point to say, yes, we do need more of those. And on the 27th, I will start uh, talking with uh, Malcolm Davis from Australia about the uh, Australian space strategy. Um, that's also pretty cool. All those events are um, online on Eventbrite. And as always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook, and on LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or our biweekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a space watcher. I can't repeat it enough. I'm a You're, space watcher. Yeah, Come yes, on. of course you are. And we're very proud that you are one of them. So, but your support, and not yours, Bariba, all of your support is uh, highly appreciated and will need us to keep our stuff 
going on here uh, with all the news that we provide and all these web talks here. Take your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global if you don't have the address at hand. I can't repeat it enough. Thanks again. Thank you from my end uh, for this very interesting talk. And you at the panel, it was outstanding to have you there. And um, all these people that we brought on stage, uh, and I think that's something what the audience will learn for the next time when, when Moriba said people's voice, he means actually people's voice. So he calls you. Um, thanks again, all of you. And I hope you all will stay safe and healthy for the, to the next time. And thanks for joining us. And I hope uh, to see you next time for us next week or in December. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. So don't forget, become a space watcher. And if you can't see that, of course, I'm a space watcher as well. So, <laughs> but just the camera angle is that, that bad. Great. That's from my end. Thank you very much, Riba. Thank you. Great show. All right, everyone. Thank you, Cheers. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Have a great one.